we moved to California and I studied with the Jehovah's Witnesses and became a Mormon for three years. Okay. With all of those religions and with all of those um, doctrinal changes, it didn't make sense. Things have to be logical for me. Yes. So I walked away from all of it, realized I did, if that was God, I didn't need any of it because it didn't make sense. It wasn't logical. Mm-hmm. But when my husband became ill, um, my brother told me to come to Calvary Chapel and to bring my Bible. And that was the start of my journey. I became uh, a born again Christian on Easter in 1989, three months after my husband was diagnosed with cancer. He came, he went home to be with the Lord the following March. And and, um, I've been the bride of Christ ever since. 30 years ago. 30 years ago. So yeah, I'm thinking to 1989. I know for me, it was, of course, I was a little bit younger, but I was, it was like 1983. So not, not too far separated as far as the, the timing is concerned there. Um, so basically, a lot of things changed from that point, I'm assuming. And, and you even just mentioned how you became a widow. And I know that obviously was a huge change for you. Um, and I think, you know, as you mentioned that, I know that I, I've seen this in others as well. But obviously, that's something we don't plan. And obviously, we don't like to lose someone that, that we care about very much. But God does find ways to to do things as a result of that experience. And and I know that since that time, he led you uh, into a lot of different ministry experiences along the way between then and now. So can you kind of give us the, the highlights of some of those, maybe that journey, and what those have meant to you? Well, to give you a full picture of my testimony, the day my husband died, March 18th, I was at his bedside, of course, and my daughter said, Mom, his eyes are open. And he had had that heavy, laborious, last gasp breathing for quite a few hours. And when I looked at him, he had beautiful Paul Newman blue eyes. Mm -hmm. I looked at him, his eyes had that death glaze, if you've ever seen anybody that's ready to go. And they sharpened like he could see something. And I looked out the window and I could see the people waiting for him on the other side. And I saw his spirit go to the people. And at that time, the Lord gave me the peace that surpasses understanding Mm. have never ever to this day as I look at you Jay been lonely that's a gift and Mm -hmm. I know that's a gift but after my husband passed away I was a brand new baby he passed away the following Easter or the in that the same time period I'd only been saved for a year and taking care of him you don't just start diving into the Bible and stuff like that. Um, even though I was now attending church and all of that, you don't catch on to what's really the relationship that you want with Christ. Right. But I went to a women's retreat uh, several weeks after my husband passed. And one of my dearest friends to this day was a sweet widow of five years. And she said, I'm going to give you your life verse, Isaiah 54, 5. For your husband is your maker. The Lord God is his name. And I laughed. I thought, yeah, like that's going to happen. I had never heard that verse in my entire life. Mm -hmm. And when I realized how true that was, I just embraced it so earnestly that that was who I was to be. And he has gifted me with the gift of singleness, which is another blessing. And so now I just waited, prayed and waited. Okay, Lord, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? And about a year later, a year and a half later, I went to a singles retreat. And the pastor said, I've just come from Africa. And my ears perked up. And he said, we were talking with the Maasai tribe that has never seen 
a white person. And we were telling them about Jesus and they had never heard of Jesus. And I thought, oh my goodness. But his parting words were, if you feel called to be a missionary, see me after I'm through here. And I made a beeline because that's my heart. I am a missionary to my very core. I have been now at my age of 77 and three quarters. <laughs> I am a missionary to my very heart. And I've been to over 60 countries. Wow. Half of them have been just to see what the country looks like and what the people are like, but half of them have been on missions. Not all of them have been medical missions, although I'm a registered nurse still to this day, but a lot of them have been evangelistic. And so when I got hooked up with Operation Christmas Child and realized that that goes hand in hand, evangelism and getting the word out with Operation Christmas Child, that that just stole my heart and told me that was my calling. Amen. You know, kind of tying in with that then is, um, so go, going to over 60 countries, like you mentioned, that kind of gives you a glimpse of what a lot of people on this side of the world have not seen. You've seen the other side of where a lot of these boxes end up. You've seen the different conditions, the different ways that people live, the different cultures. Many of us have not been too many places. I mean, we're just very blinded, I think, to not really being able to understand what it's like in other places. So, so does that give you, I guess, a, a whole different perspective as you're packing boxes on this side? Absolutely. And it's, it's always humorous to me, having seen the other side, I've had the privilege and honor of going on two distributions. The first one was eight years ago, I went to Uganda. And then five years later, I went to Rwanda. Mm. Seeing those two countries receiving the shoeboxes changed my whole outlook about what to put in the shoeboxes and what not to put on the shoeboxes. But it's amazing to then come back after all of these countries and hear people's perspective on, well, you don't want to give them a pink toothbrush because they might not like the color pink. Mm -hmm. That kind of minutia, they are just grateful for a toothbrush so they don't have to share it. Yes. That kind of thinking doesn't occur to Americans who are lovingly and kindly packing shoeboxes. Mm -hmm. If you got three or four toothbrushes, put them in the box. God knows who's going to get that box and what they really need. Amen. Amen. So these different ministry experiences have all kind of gone into who you are right now. Um, and I know that... Um, Ministry is, is everywhere, right? I mean, so it's not only going on missions. It's not only doing Operation Christmas Child uh, boxes and all of that. But ministry also takes place in what we would consider this, the secular workplace. I know there's a lot of people out there that they'll do Operation Christmas Child, but they're also doing, you know, they have their regular job. Um, God put you in an interesting place. You were many years, I'll, I'll let you say how many but you work at a place that most people would be familiar with, and that would be Disneyland. Um, so how, tell us about that. And how did that fit, how does that kind of fit into your overall person of who God's made you in this process? I was a registered nurse at Disneyland for 17 years. I retired one year and one week ago. I loved that job because I couldn't believe in the beginning that I actually worked there. I had been a legal nurse consultant before that doing uh, investigations for law firms on medical malpractice and that kind of thing. So to go to a job that was as much fun and as lighthearted and, and just uh, talk about a 180 in occupation, yeah. <laughs> I loved it. But I kept asking the Lord, really, you really want me to work here? I mean, they pay me to be here. Most people pay to get in here. You're paying me to stay here. So this one day I had um, the biggest question of all, Lord, I need, I need you to show me this is where you want me. 
-hmm. I need proof. I'm Gideon all the way. I need a, I'm going to put a fleece out there. I want absolute proof. This is where you want me to work. And so I'm standing there at the front desk in the health services department. And this lady comes in the front door. We had big old wide double doors and they came bursting open and she shoves this big truck driver guy through the door and he's sitting in a wheelchair. Mm. And she says, he's got cancer and needs to lay down. And she shoves the chair. And I looked at my coworker and I said, you take him, I'll take her. My husband died of cancer. I know where she is. I know where her heart is. I know how she's hurting. So she went out with me and we sat on the, the little bench that was in front of first aid. We sat there for over an hour mm -hmm. while I ministered to her and it was straight ministry. And at the end, I said, do you have a church? You need a church. God will be with you through this whole thing, but you have to let him in and give him your pain, give him your sorrow, give him your grieving. Yeah. So she found, I gave her the name of a really good church out in Redlands. I knew the pastor. And so that was my proof positive that I was supposed to be working there and that that was my mission field. And I can tell you story after story of how many coworkers I prayed with, how many guests I prayed with, how many divine appointments I had there at the park. It was just a wonderful place to work. I really, really loved it. And I thank the Lord for the 17 years that I had there to enjoy it. Amen. So there, there's proof positive, you know, wherever God puts us, he puts us in places. There's a place you never expected to be, but he had it all in the plan. <laughs> Right. I mean, it, it was so outrageous that you had to sit there and, and question, God, show me that this is actually that I'm not just fooling myself here. Right. But, yep. uh, but looking back at that now, obviously, you're able to see story after story, which which was the reason why you were there. All right. OK, so let's get to Operation Christmas Child a little bit more here. I know okay. it's, it's near and dear to your heart. In fact, I would say knowing you it is completely accurate to say that you live and breathe operation christmas child i, I mean that, that is definitely uh correct um you are the area coordinator and have been area coordinator in san gabriel valley for quite a while now 10 so, years um how much 10 years 10 years 15 with operation christmas child but this is my 10th year as area coordinator Right. Okay. So what, what is the part about that position uh, that you like the most? My team. I love my team. Mm -hmm. And I can see the Lord's hand on this area in San Gabriel Valley. And my team members are just outstanding. Every single one that I have had on my team has such a servant's heart that we are literally iron sharpening iron. We complement each other beautifully in that we have the worker bees and we have the leaders and we have the, the enthusiastic and we have the, the quiet behind the scenes. No, I don't wanna to talk to anybody in public as well as the ones that I'll go there and speak, I'll make a presentation. We have an excellent balance in our team. Amen. So it's, it's amazing to see how God you know, the Bible tells us that God gives each one of us different distinct spiritual gifts. And yes. he puts in exactly in churches and ministry teams. He, he puts exactly in what he needs. Have you over the course of time, because I know this is something that, that I've noticed in the course of time over my life. Have you um, gotten to the point where you appreciate more or you notice more, especially gifts that God he puts in others that maybe you and I were not so strong in and we and we start to really appreciate the fact that he brings those people along yes one thing I would run out of the room screaming rather than do is to be a drop-off team leader I can't do that I can't do that I have tried that so many times and people say oh it's so easy. All you have to do is put the boxes in a, in a stack of five and then you count them and then you put them in that box and you make up your tally. It's nothing. And my, my instant reaction is always, can you read an EKG? 
it's easy. Anything is easy when you know how to do it. Right. I have gone to drop off locations now for 15 years mm -hmm. and I try to help out and I mess up everything because I will start with a stack of five and then I'll start counting and then somebody else comes in and I'm ADHD. So then all of a sudden my attention is drawn someplace else. Yeah. I can't remember. Did I already count those shoe boxes? Are those the ones that now how many were in that box before we started adding and I go crazy. I go absolutely crazy. So I love and adore and pamper and spoil my drop-off teams because they are awesome. We have nine this year, mm -hmm. six Chick-fil-A's uh, where people can take their boxes on specific dates. But I just love my, my I now have two central drop-offs. One yeah. of them is just across the road from you in Baldwin Park, brand new this year at New Beginnings. And then at Inland Hills Church in Chino. And Sue Berman has been my right hand for a decade now. Yeah. In her 10th year. Yeah, and that's one thing you, you mentioned there is you've had people that have served with you for quite a long time. And I imagine the relationships must really just build very deep over that period of time. They are. And what I love about, about my long-termers is they are my iron. And they will give me a little whack upside the head if I get out of line. And uh, one of my dearest that has been on the team literally since day one will chastise me when I, when I mess up. And I was doing it for a while because she said, you know what? We don't hang anymore. I was getting so focused on Operation Christmas Child that I wasn't maintaining friendships. It right. was all business and no hanging. Yeah. So I took that to heart. I listened to her and now we hang. <laughs> That's, good. That's good. You know, it's, I think as you mentioned that, because there's, there's a loyalty between friends that, that comes in and, and fellow servants of, of the Lord, brothers and sisters in Christ. And I think that, I mean, tell me if you agree that loyalty doesn't, isn't blind. You know, it's not, I'll just go with you, whatever you do. Loyalty is that I have your back and your best interest, even when you're wrong. And I'm going to tell you, but I'm going to tell you, not everyone else. Yes. And that's very important. And I know over the years, things have come up, even with you and I, mm -hmm. I'll say something to you. You'll say something back to me. Are you aware of that? And of course, the older you get, the more you say, what did I say? No, that's not what I meant at all. And if people don't call me on it, then people, other people will have the wrong impression. Right. You know, well, this is what I meant to say. Isn't this what I said? And they'll say, no, that isn't what you said at all. This is what you said. So yeah. I really appreciate that kind of friendship and that kind of honesty. Absolutely. I think it's really vitally important. And, and when you can have team members that you can count on to do that, uh, those, those are worth more than gold right there. Well, I've also appreciated uh, keeping friendships, even though uh, our teams have multiplied and we had several that um, are now blessed to be on another team, that those friendships have continued, even though they're not team members on my team any longer, we're still friends. And that means a lot to me. Absolutely. So, and, and you know, tying into that, since you bring that up, um, I think it's a, it's a credit to what God's done through your leadership uh, on the fact that a team could even be large enough where it needs to multiply. And the, and the thing that a lot of people may not know about your team is, is here you had a team of about 40 something people. God multiplied it into two areas because San Gabriel Valley was, uh, is very large. And then so you lost about 15 people, 15, 18 people off that team. And by later the next year, you had as many, if not more, than you had before it, it multiplied. Am I correct? We're back up to 42 again. Right. So, and, and I know there's a lot of there's a lot of places in the country that that they're blessed to have even in, and thank God for them. But to even have six to eight people on a team is large right. in some cases. So, um, you know, God puts where, where he needs, what he needs, where he needs it. And, and uh, we just want to encourage everybody out there, no matter what size your team is and everything, to just doing what you're doing because God's going to use it. So um, 
All right, let's see here. So, yeah, another question I'm, I'm reading off of what I wanted to ask you here. There are a lot of ministries out there, obviously. Operation Christmas Child is not the only one, and it's not the only one that God is doing great things through, okay? And I'll give you an opportunity in a couple minutes to discuss some of the others that you've been involved in. But with all those ministries that you could pick, you know, that are out there, countless ones, why do you think, what is it about this one that intrigues you so much and which has caused you to really dive in there and just dedicate so much of your life to it? Because I have seen firsthand the impact of a simple shoebox. We all know biblically and, and uh, scripturally that when the last man hears of Jesus Christ, we're out of here. Mm -hmm. And because of the push that Franklin Graham has on reaching the last man standing in the Polynesian islands, in the Indonesian islands, in the Philippine islands, where people have never even heard of Christ, you know, I keep thinking that we're getting closer and closer to that day. And certainly looking at our circumstances around us, we know that the day is coming closer and closer. And I'm a traveler, so to me, the rapture is just going to be my best ticket. Yeah, and talk about a rapid flight. Huh? Um, <laughs> now, here, here's the thing, you know, as you, as you mentioned that, you know, this year, obviously, in 2020 has been one for the books. Um, definitely uh, different than any other year in any of our lifetimes. Do you get the sense, because I get the sense this year, you know, there was a lot of temptation that a lot of people had. It's like, oh, this is a crazy year. I don't know if we're going to be able to do this or how much we're going to be able to do. But, but here's the sense that I got, and maybe you did as well. I wonder, as we pack these boxes this year, I wonder, is it the last ones we'll pack? Have you ever thought of that? Did that come to your mind at I all? Have. I have. Because knowing what I know about the ministry... I know that on this side of the pond, everybody that touches a shoebox has 10 people that also touch the shoebox. And that being that when you go to the Dollar Tree or you go to Target or you go to anywhere and you start hoovering, sorry about that, that's the Amazon man. When you start hoovering shelves and you just take your arm and you take every single item that's there and you fill up your basket in one fell swoop, people say, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. and your open door. Yeah. So I can't tell you how many times I've been at the Dollar Tree or the 99 cent store or, or anywhere picking up stuff and you buy 200 of something mm -hmm. and uh, you have a chance to share. Well, as you become known in this ministry, as you are, people want to know. I'm also a walking billboard. You've known me for, what, eight years now? Have you ever seen me without an OCC t-shirt? I'm always dressed when I go out in something that says OCC. Right. So people will say, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And... Like we found out at, at Chick-fil-A last week, oh my goodness, we had so much fun. We were at the end of the line for Chick-fil-A and especially in West Covina, which was our last day. The, the owner operator, Daniel, had his staff tell people, don't forget to pick up your, your shoebox right over there. And they had to pass by us mm. in order to get a shoebox. So we would go up to the window we were masked and gloved. We had our shoe boxes. Do you know about this ministry? And you talk about an elevator speech to the second floor because now another car is coming, another car is coming. Right. So it was just rapid fire, but it really honed our skills in telling about Operation Christmas Child. But I know the impact on the other end, and how important it is when those children get a gift and the 10 that are going to understand it at the other end it's going the party distribution whatever you want to call it is given by a church right in fact, when i first was asked to join i said oh good i want to go distribute boxes and she said that's not going to happen mm -hmm. why 
because we want these children to know that these gifts came from Jesus Christ. They didn't come from a little blue-eyed grandma mm -hmm. with gray hair. And I, I totally respect that. I totally understand that because they're right. Yeah. It shouldn't be us giving the kids the box. We're just the intermediary and being the hands of Christ. God loves you. And we learned how to say that in Ugandan and in Rwandan so that we could give the kids the gifts and realize God loves you. And that's still the most important lesson that Franklin teaches. He, you won't see him on television for, for a minute and a half without him saying, God loves you. Right. Very much like his father on that one. That's for sure. Yes. Very yeah. consistent. Yeah. It's a consistent message and uh, a very bold leader, for sure. Yes. Uh, with a great heart. Surely sound. Yes, absolutely. What I appreciate about him. Absolutely. And, um, you know, it's not always so easy to be that way, but but he takes a very strong stand, which is, is definitely appreciated and needed. Um, so, yeah, you know, you're mentioning how, how God takes these things to the other side. I, I think that's one of the most amazing things about OCC is that, um, and I know we've noticed it this year as well, not knowing what resources we could get, and God just keeps throwing the resources. Yes. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of humbling when you think that we really don't have to be too smart to be able to do this. God has figured it all out. I mean, he knows, he's able to take an exact box to an exact child yes. in another part of the world at the exact right time with exactly what they needed. Yes. Nothing that any human engineering could in any way figure out. And yet God does it over and over again. He's the missionaries in place he's put the churches in places around the world and and uh really i mean considering the story of occ if people don't know it that i mean even franklin graham was not looking to do this it's not something that he came up with god just kind of pushed it right in you know into his direction this has all been a thing of god from the beginning and so it, is it kind of just kind of neat to kind of just do our part and watch him just work? I have been amazed this year, like never before, because I've, I'm, I'm standing back and watching him move. Mm -hmm. Before I'm the planner, I'm the organizer, I'm the leader, I have to get this done, I have to have my notes for Sunday, and yada, 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 and that just went out the window. Oh, nothing is going right. Well, we're going to have an affirmation party and we're going to thank all of our donors and that didn't happen. And right. we're going to have a, a, a celebration event to kick off the season and give out free shoe boxes. That didn't happen. And I've just, what are you going to do next, Lord? I'm waiting. Yeah. Even when this, when this disappointment came that the church where we normally have our packing party was not able to have it. He came up with a new plan and coming together. Um, it's a little, it's a little intimidating when you want to pack 3000 shoe boxes as you did last year. Um, but to see his hand in it and to see the product come in and to see the volunteers that are coming forward. I just, I just had a gentleman um, here at my home today. He's helping me in my, wood, my workshop, my wood shop. And he says, oh, by the way, let me know when the uh, packing party is going to be. My Bible study wants to come. Their friends want to come. My, you know, right. people from my church want to come. And I go, wow, this is going to happen. I'm sure there's going to be no doubt um, when it's over. You're going to understand exactly. There's going to be reasons why exactly it's going to be at your home. in your yes. front yard. And of course, God gave you the room for it. He gave you the front yes. yard to do it. So yes. um, it'll all make sense, right? Life is always best understood backwards, not forwards. Yes, and we, what, we have such a great examples. Just before I came on air with you, I was doing my Bible study, finishing up my Bible study for tonight. And my church women's study is going through the heroes of faith, mm -hmm. Hebrews 11. Yes. So tonight is Abraham and Sarah. Well, could there be any better parallel for our faith, lack of faith, jumping out in front of the Lord, you know, uh, not trusting, <laughs> you know, just that whack alongside the head. 
I'm in charge here and I'll get it done. Okay. Just trust me. Exactly. <laughs> Just the like word they ram and you read the words of, of Sarah, you realize, yeah, history is repeating itself again. Absolutely. God, God is a uh, consistent. Yes. Sure. Right. So immutable. I like that word. Immutable. Absolutely. Um, now, in addition to Operation Christmas Child, because that's not the only ministry you've been involved in, um, in addition to your ministry uh, missionary journeys that you went in various countries, 60 different countries, as you've told us, um, you've also had a major part being a sponsor, being involved in some lives of children through Compassion International. It's an organization that you've yes. um, definitely supported. Tell us, um, tell us some good things about that and, and how that's been a blessing. I got hooked up with uh, Compassion International through Operation Christmas Child. And I went to a little tiny church that it wasn't even in our area, but there was no area coordinator for Corona at that time. And they were having Mission Sunday. And so we all set up our tables with all of our literature and everything. And right next to us was a lady uh, from Compassion, and she said, I'll do shoeboxes if you, if you sponsor a child. Well, we had just had a very unfortunate um, revelation about another child sponsorship program that had become corrupt. And so I said, okay, I'll look at it, um, and I'll see if I feel this is um, a calling from the Lord for me to get involved with this. So I took a trip with Compassion International uh, to Thailand. I had never been there, didn't know anything about it, except I loved their food. <laughs> and as we were on our journey, uh, there were about 30, 35 of us. I pestered the daylights out of the tour leader. And we're still friends to this day, which I love. Her name yeah. is Joanne. And she's about my age. And well, what about this? Well, what happens when, well, what if, and just on and on and on, all of my doubts, all of my fears, all of my um, reservations were questions. And so we were, we were in one place uh, where we were on a, on a dinner uh, on a river right outside of Bangkok. Yeah. And she introduced me to the president of Thailand, Compassion. And she said, I want you to meet this young man. Ellie has a lot of questions. <laughs> and yeah. he was so kind and so patient with me. But I love, love, love that ministry. I feel like it is absolutely above board, which is very important to me, much like um, Samaritan's Purse and Operation Christmas Child. They opened their books when we went to the headquarters. Um, and so I am now on my fourth, fifth, and sixth child that I have supported with them. Um, I just this past February went to Kenya to visit my little girl. Her name is Joyce, and she is 16. And so when, when my children reach 16, uh, I go and visit them. It's time for the talk. And the talk is, if you are a serious student, then I am a serious sponsor, and I will put you through college. And one of the visitors on the trip said, wow, that's awesome. We were in El Salvador, and this same scenario was coming up with, with Brian, my little boy in, in um, El Salvador that I had been uh, sponsoring since he was six mm. or 16. And so I said, Juan, our tour guide, how much is it going to cost me to put Brian through medical school? And he says, about $35 a month. And my friend was astounded, astounded. And he says, and then you're going to bring him to the United States. No, America doesn't need more doctors. El Salvador needs doctors. Mm -hmm. He's got the smarts to do it. So now when I went to visit Joyce in Kenya, now her eyes are open to the possibilities. And I said to her teachers and her, her um, chaperones, 
because you're never allowed to be alone with your child, which I love because a lot of the sponsors are men. They want everything to be above reproach. I appreciated that. Mm -hmm. And I said, how much is it going to cost me to send? Because I don't know. You know, it may be way much more than that. How much would it cost me if she decides she wants to go to medical school? And she said, it'll cost you about, about $50 a month. I can handle that. Yeah. So we went to her home. Her home is a 10 by 10 cement block, no windows, no water, nothing except a bed and a couch and a table and of course a television. They did have electricity, but they did not have running water. They did not have a bathroom. They had nothing. And there were six people living in it. Mm. When you walk outside, the uh, sewer runs in front of their in front of their house. There's a tin roof. And I've been to the slums of Nairobi. I've been to the slums of India. I've been all over to see the incredible difference that we can make sponsoring children like that. And what's broken my heart now for the last four years is I supported and sponsored a child in India and Compassion was kicked out of India hundreds of thousands of children, their sponsorships were dropped. And my heart is broken to this day because I went and I met him. I promised his father I would put him through school and all communication is cut off. So I just pray every day that the Lord knew this was coming and for him to take care of it and take care of him and his dad. Amen. Well, what a difference though. What a difference to be able to make and, and, and what part of your story is what a lot of people don't do, and that's to actually go and then meet them in person like that. Yes. And have yes. a life-changing type of uh, impact there. So that, well, the way, the way the program has been set up, the child must write their sponsor at least four times a year. So every three months, I get a, a letter. And of course, when I met Brian, I said, Brian... I do not want like, I do not want one more letter that says I like mangoes. I have been sponsoring you for 10 years. Do you know how many times you have told me in your letters you like mangoes? I want to know the good stuff. Do you have a girlfriend? Oh my gosh, she turned every color of the rainbow and just absolutely was thunderstruck that I would ask him if he had a girlfriend. Well, did he have a girlfriend? Or? He had three. <laughs> I see. Okay. There you go. You, you got more than you bargained for on that answer. <laughs> but it was such a joy to meet him and to know the difference that my sponsorship made. But I love the fact that I investigated it first so that I could really pour my heart into it because I was heartbroken when, when my child in India was taken away. I felt like I felt I grieved. Just cried for days. Still can, but well, it means so much to those kids to get those letters, and so many sponsors don't write. They just kind of send the money, and that's it, huh? Yeah, which, which is great, but but uh, sometimes I don't understand the. I think we just don't understand the how much the communication could make a difference. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me get to the next one here. So you already mentioned what, what did you say seventy. I, I probably seven and three quarters. Seventy-seven and three quarters. <laughs> so, being seventy-seven and three quarters, which doesn't appear that you're, I, I'm, I'm going to take your word for it. But I know activity-wise and everything else, energy-wise, enthusiasm-wise, you don't appear in any way to be seventy-seven and three quarters. Typically, a lot of people at this stage in life are just trying to. Stay healthy, slow down, relax a little bit. I'm sure you've been told to do that probably several times. Um, I think of you, and this, this, this is a comparison that I don't want to put you on the spot here, but, but one of my greatest old heroes of the faith would be D.L. Moody. And I remember um, in the story of D.L. Moody, 
he was getting on the older side there or up there in years he had some health issues in his case and his doctor told him that he needed to take it easy he was preaching about five to seven times a day he needed to take it easy slow down go retire and so he gave in um he ended up on a boat that was about to be taken down and sink and he went down into the um into the galley of the boat to pray and basically he said that god told him uh, if you think you need to slow down then i can just take you right now uh so and so he basically just did everything he could you if anything are more active now than ever um you don't seem to be slowing down at all so what is it that's driving you at this point i'm not old well that's true <laughs> No, but as as you do start to see age, these aren't my hands, these are my mother's hands. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. As you see your body starting to sag where it didn't used to sag, um, and you can feel an ache and a pain and things like that, you can give into it or you can fight it. And uh, I'm I'm the type that don't plant me until I die. When I'm dead, then you can plant me. Mm -hmm. Tell me what I can't do. I'll try anything. You know, I went zip lining a couple of years ago with my kids and, and uh, I love to go whitewater rafting and I love those kinds of activities. And, and I, when I was in my 50s, I guess, my best friend says, oh, I won't go on a roller coaster. Why not? I don't know. I don't know why people talk themselves into being old, mm -hmm. and they'll say, "And the kids are the worst." I will tell you, the kids are the worst. Well, mom, you know, you're getting up there. You shouldn't do that anymore. My kids know. Don't even say that to me, because then I will go out and do it twice as bad as they ever thought of. Mm -hmm. But I, if I can't lift that fifty pounds then I'll tell me I can't lift that pounds. Don't take it away from me, at least the opportunity to try. Amen. So is there that sense, is, is there that sense of urgency in the sense that, um, I mean, none of us at any age know how many more opportunities we have to do the things that God gives us to do. So, right. so is there the urgency that, especially after doing it for a while, maybe even an appreciation to say, you know what, I see the importance in this and I'm gonna do it every single opportunity for as long as God gives me that opportunity to do so. I have seen so much life in my life. I've seen so much death in my life. And I think it's tragic when people decide that they're dead when they're still alive and breathing. Mm -hmm. Now I can go back to when I was in nurses school a hundred years ago and I saw cardiac invalids. Oh, I can't do that. I might have a heart attack. If that's the way you're going to live, die now. What's the purpose? Right. In such fear that you don't do anything? I don't think that's why the Lord put us here. I think the Lord put us here to do his work, to give him glory, and to see his magnificent world. Right. And I know a lot of people don't like to travel that's on them. But I love, I love to travel. I love to see the world that he gave us. I love to see his creativity and his imagination. And, and uh, I learned something every single day. And if we have just a minute, when this COVID hit, I had just come back from, from Africa. Um, after I met my little girl, Joyce, and it was only a one day visit. The next day I flew to Zimbabwe and I got to, first thing off the, off the plane, I meet my driver that's gonna take me to my hotel and, and I said, is there, is there a, I understand there's a helicopter ride over Victoria Falls. He says, yeah, you wanna go now? Sure, that's why I came. So we went literally from the airport to the helicopter pad and I went over Victoria Falls. It was just stunning. But now I've been to Iwasu in Brazil. I've been to, I was born and raised in Buffalo. So I've been to Niagara. 
I mean, I've seen some of these absolutely magnificent falls, but the reason I was in Zimbabwe was to catch up with the Nomad Tours, and we went on safari for 10 days. And I have phenomenal pictures of herds of elephants and herds of, of zebra and magnificent um, animals in their habitat and everything. And I think, how many people get to do this? I get to do this. And I praise you, Lord, for this and for allowing me to do this. I love to travel. I don't mind traveling alone if, if nobody wants to go with me. Uh, and the, my friend that's walked back and forth a couple of times for her 80th birthday, I said, where do you want to go? I'll take you anywhere you want to go. She says, I want to walk the Great Wall. Uh, okay. So we went to China for two weeks. It was absolutely fabulous. And she's, you talk about spirit and enthusiasm and physicality. She walks every single day and she ran <laughs> up to the Great Wall. But it's just it's just such a phenomenal world that we live in. That's awesome. You know, I, I what you're you're saying all these things, and I, I think that too often, too often, people do not live to enjoy, just learn to enjoy the moments, the yes. moments that God gives. They're always thinking about something else, worrying about something else, having some anxiety about what could happen, should happen, might happen, and and they. Oh, what if I die? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're home with the Lord in a perfect body. What's the bad side? Right. And, and, and so I think I'll we... See you in a while. I'm going on the bus ahead of you. Yeah. We, we miss out on, on parts of life because... And, and, and so if a person, you know, thinks that, um, like you mentioned, some people die long before they die physically. Yeah. They've already put themselves in the grave. And the reality is if God was finished with us, we'd be gone. Yes, and tomorrow is promised to no one. Mm -hmm. So when you hear that you you have a terminal disease or something like that, okay, now you know pretty much maybe how you're going to go. Mm -hmm. You don't know when, and maybe the Lord will heal you. True. And so, meanwhile, every day that you wake up is another opportunity. It's for some reason. That's right. Yeah. All right. Last question, because I know you have a Bible study to get to. I do. And, um, but it's, it's a good one, all right? Um, in the world today, like I said, 2020 has been a year for the, for the books. And I believe it's a year that the book mentions uh, to a degree. There's a lot of things that are happening in our world that seem to very much line up with some of the things that we have seen in the Bible. It seems almost as if the pages of the Bible are being lived out in living color in our headlines, on our television screens. Um, and the time could be short and Jesus could absolutely return very soon. So how is that right now? It's kind of similar to what I asked you before, but how, how is that fueling in you and even increased urgency to reach as many with the gospel as possible. Well, we all know people who do not know the Lord, don't want to know the Lord, could care less about the Lord, and talk to the hand. I don't want to hear it. You know, I'm from a family, we don't talk religion or politics, which is sad because it gets to be your conversation is, is so shallow and superficial. I can have deeper conversations with you than I can with my sister mm -hmm. because we have that commonality with knowing where we're going to be and we get to spend eternity together. Right. And yet what is my urgency is the Lord has, has promised that he will not come until the last man is heard. And so I keep hoping that he is going to do a work in my sister. He's going to do a work in my son. He is going to have them wake up and know that he is very much alive and very much real. And there is an eternity. And where you spend it is your choice. But the Old Testament also teaches me that it's my responsibility that you've heard. 
if I'm standing there with this news and I don't share it with you, then that's on me. Mm -hmm. That is our responsibility is to get that word out there and to make sure that, that it, it's not on me for to make you come to the Lord, but it is my responsibility to share that so that you know that you have the opportunity and that Jesus loves you, just like Franklin says. And the joy is when, and I've had, we were talking about Disneyland, at least three or four people at Disneyland came to the Lord while I was there because of our talking back and forth. And um, we were having a meeting at my house and one of the nurses just walked in the door, you know, because the door is open when I have meeting day. And she walked in and I thought, wow, wonder what she's doing here. She's never been to my house before. And Jennifer Trevithick was there, who at that time was our regional manager, right? Mm -hmm. And so as and we were like three minutes from finishing and everything. So we were in our final prayers and everything. And so I'm kind of puzzled. And I walked out into the kitchen and I said, hi. She says, I wanted you to be the first to know. The first one to know. I gave my life to the Lord this morning. And it's your fault. <laughs> That's awesome. It changed our whole friendship. It changed our whole dynamic because she was the one that we would be standing at the front desk. And if there wasn't anybody there, we would start talking about Christ and Christians and, and Bible study and all of the Christians would start talking and she'd, ah, and she'd walk away. Mm -hmm. so she'd start the conversation <laughs> while we were standing there at the front desk. So it, it totally changed our our whole, uh, our whole relationship. So my urgency is that all will know and that the Lord will see and be gracious to my family. Amen. Amen. So what we're going to do is we close this up. If you don't mind, I want to have a word of prayer for you and then also for everybody else that's out there and then we'll, we'll close it up. So let's, let's pray. Thank you, gracious God, for the time I've been able to spend with Ellie today. I thank you for what you've done through her life and what you continue to do through her life. I just pray you keep watching over her, give her the endless energy and enthusiasm that you have placed within her and may her ministry that you do in her continue to be fruitful, um, continue to reach others and um, that she'll continue to be used by you to touch many lives. Father, we pray for everybody listening today. First of all, we pray that they have a relationship, a personal relationship with you through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to come to you, Father. And um, it would be our prayer that each one has the peace that passes all understanding, knowing that their sins were paid for on the cross, and that Jesus' blood paid for it all, and that we can have life uh, through his name. And Father, we pray for the various ministries, people out there, especially as we launch into what is soon to be National Collection Week for Operation Christmas Child. We just pray, Father, that you'll take every single box and every single effort uh, from everyone out there and direct it to exactly the right child and the right family. Uh, we know that you are God is in control, and so we have our confidence and we have our hope in you. We pray especially, as Ellie reminds us at the end, that the time is coming short and we are anxiously awaiting the appearing of your son. But at the same time, there is, a, there is an urgency, there is a burden upon our heart, and that's that we have loved ones and friends who have yet not come to a relationship with you. We pray for them. We pray, Father, that if it be your will, we pray that you would reach into their life through others and through your spirit and change them before the time comes. And Father, we just commit all this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we have the debate tonight, we pray for the Lord's will to be done. Amen. In fact, when I get off, I'm going to turn it on. So. And make sure you vote. Amen. Thank you so much, Ellie. Appreciate you. And uh, we'll be talking. And I'm sure many will be blessed. You have a great night. Thank you, sweetie. Talk to you soon.